If you've got your Bibles this morning, then turn with me to the book of Ephesians. We've been doing a series on the Spirit-filled life. And I'd like to actually continue it on for the next uh, couple of weeks. So um, we will go a little bit further with it over the next uh, two weeks. But it's Ephesians 5 for those who have got their Bibles. We will have it on the overhead this morning. And reading uh, from verse 15, Ephesians 5, reading from verse 15. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Verse 18, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs amongst yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, and further, submit to one another out of a reverence for Christ. I love these verses because it tells me that Jesus has come to give us life and give it abundantly. And you and I don't have to do drugs to try and find life. We don't have to get drunk to try and ease our pain. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, it's the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of spirits out there. There's some you can drink. There's a lot of evil ones. But thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God he's holy. God is holy. And and, uh, God's spirit, as he fills us, invigorates our life, strengthens us. And uh, as we know, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all those wonderful fruits that we need in our lives to build good lives, build good marriages, and do good in our world and be a wonderful influence. Can I have an amen? amen. And so God says, don't, don't go the way of the world, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he says these three things, uh, the Apostle Paul. And so, first of all, he said, look, Be filled by singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Make the music. And so we spoke about that the first week where I spoke about keeping the music in your soul. Keep the ha-ha in your spirit. Don't lose the ha-ha. Don't lose that joy that is there. And it's not so much happiness. Paul didn't say, stay happy. He said, keep the joy. in your your heart and and we do that by making music in our heart and uh, no matter what we face in life I just encourage you keep your joy if you keep your joy you'll get your goods back if you keep your joy you'll keep your strength and so joy is, is such a powerful thing in our lives and one of the definitions for joy was a confidence in the character of God and if you can have a confidence in the character of God then no matter what you face in life, you'll have an inner joy. It'll just bubble up. No matter what's going on, it'll be there, that joy. And then it says, be thankful. And so we spoke about being thankful. That's the confession of your mouth. And I challenged you all a couple of weeks ago to go one day without complaining. Did you do it? Did you do your homework? You know, it's challenging to go one day without whinging about something. We're getting worse than the poms. You realise that, don't you? You heard of the whinging poms? You know, well, we won't go there. But we don't, we don't want to be a mob of whingers. You know, and, and uh, it's just great to be around people who are enthusiastic and are speaking words of life. You know, we are, we are so blessed uh, to live where we are and to have what we have. And so let's, let's be a people. And there's something that happens in our life 
Because Paul here is saying, be filled with the Spirit by doing these things. You know, keep the joy and keep a good confession. Keep a happy confession. Keep a, a thankful confession. And it's not, you know, as I said a couple of weeks ago, if your do dog dies, you don't jump up and down. Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know, no, it's, it's, it's giving thanks in everything. You know, and through these things. So stuff will happen, but God, I love you, I thank you, and, uh, and I bless you. And uh, bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And then uh, the Apostle Paul goes on to say, and further, and everybody say, and further. submit to one another out of a reverence for Christ. This is an interesting one, isn't it? And you're all sitting there this morning saying, what is he going to preach about this? When I first, uh, you know, looked at this message, I thought, wow, th this, is, this is just sort of out, out from left field. This is, this is different, you know, from, from joy and thanks and praise and reading the word and doing all. But it says, submit to one another. And so we need to be joyful we need to be thankful and we need to be accountable. If, uh, if you're here as a guest today, I've in 37, 8 years of preaching, I've only ever preached this message once before and that was 3 or 4 years ago. So it's not a message that I'm going to preach regularly, but I believe it's a message that everyone needs to hear of being accountable one to another. It's, it's, as you'll hear me speaking, it, it runs right through life that we need to be accountable. And once we learn that principle, it will be so helpful to you. If joy is the petrol in your tank, then accountability is the oil in your engine. You know, when you've got a full tank of gas, yippee! When, when there's oil in the tank, oh yeah, that's good. Well, this is one of those messages, it's not a sort of a yippee one, but I tell you, it's good to know there's oil in the engine because you're not going to blow up, honey. You're not going to be down the road somewhere stuck on the side of the road. This will help you do life well. And uh, when it comes to accountability, it's really a little bit like fences. You know, fences are very, very helpful. I'm so appreciating all the fences they're putting on our major highways today. They stop those kangaroos jumping across the road. I thank God for the farmers that put fences. I think I've got an image of a fence there on somewhere. You know, fences stop animals getting out onto the road. My brother Philip and his wife, Noel might remember this, but they were coming home late. Uh, from Tamworth, they were in, in town and they had to drive out to the farm one night. It was quite late and they were coming home in a ute and a horse got out onto the road and tragically sort of came right in front of them and the horse went straight through the windscreen of the car and right between, you know, Philip and Wendy there, he went right, you know, between them. It could have, could have killed them. It was amazing they, they didn't get killed. Everybody say fences are good. The Ten Commandments are good. Some look at the Ten Commandments and say, well, they're intrusive in my life. They take away my freedom. No, I'm telling you today, the commandments of God and accountability actually bring us into freedom. They give us boundaries that we can enjoy our world and we're not frightened we're going to fall off a cliff we're not going to run into something in the dark that uh, we couldn't see so accountability helps us uh, and gives us tracks to run on it gives us boundaries that we can and they're like fences and so it says there in verse 20 of chapter 5 and further submit to one another out of a reverence for Christ so if we are accountable one to another, then uh, in, in life there is authorities that are there. But authority in our world is not there to, 
you know, be overbearing, to be bossy. Authority is there to help us, as I've already said, bring freedom. It's there to build this up. It's not there to make a big title for someone. It's not about making a person more important than others. It's actually about freedom for those around you. It actually says here, in the fear of God or out of a reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of a reverence for Christ. And so that's speaking about when we serve Christ in our world, the, the law no longer is our ruler, Jesus Christ is. And so the Apostle Paul is saying here, be accountable to, to one another in your serving Christ in life. And so he's connecting that thought together. You know, Jesus had all authority, and yet he was the greatest servant of all. And so authority doesn't need to be negative. It, it can, can be sometimes if it's abusive, but authority actually in its right place is a wonderful thing. And so the Apostle Paul in chapter 5 goes on, he lists a number of things that are there in regards to authority. And I want to get into them this morning because the first one he speaks about marriage. And in chapter uh, 5 there, verse 21 or 22, uh, ladies, all put your seatbelts on. So you're ready for this. For wives... For wives, this means submit to your husbands. And all the husbands said? All the wives said? Ah, this, is, this is where it gets exciting, everybody. You ready for some excitement here? For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the saviour of his body, the church, as... The church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Woohoo! For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Ouch! He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. So, here... Paul comes and says, well, look, this submission one to another, this accountability one to another needs to be in marriage. And so wives submit to your husbands. They are called the head. The head is not there to dominate so much, but the head speaks about leadership in a family, in a marriage. And I just believe it's good for the girls to allow the guys to lead. Ah, oh, but pastor, we're all equal. Yeah, we are. But we have different responsibilities. And that's the key. It doesn't mean he's any better or of more value than the girls. It, it simply means that he has a different responsibility in life and in marriage. Now, you're going to get a whole lot of people out there that disagree with this today, but at the end of the day, I'm not saying this. This is the Bible. And uh, having been married now for almost 40 years, it's still working for us, honey. You know, I think the key with it all is that if the man is willing to lay down his life, if he, is, if he in his heart will say, I want to make her a queen, if he will love her as Christ loved the church, I find that the girls easily submit. If he's a dominating, controlling male chauvinist, then you'll have trouble with that. Stephen. <laughs> and so you'll have trouble anyway, no matter what you do. <laughs> so that's the key, you know. But at the end of the day... At the end of the day, there, there should be that respect there, that accountability that says, you're my man, you're the head of this house, and I'm actually going to come under your submission. Oh, yes. You know, sometimes us husbands have to have tough love with our wives. Is that right, men? 
Then all, all the guys have just gone quiet. Blokes, you're supposed to be helping me here. <laughs> you know, you heard about the bloke. You heard about the bloke whose wife just wouldn't stop spending. She just wouldn't stop spending all the money. So she came home one day and she'd been out spending all the money. And, she, and he said, "Darling, I'm going to give you plastic surgery." And she said, "Oh, I've been looking forward to that." And he said, "Yeah, give me a credit card." <laughs> so he cut up a credit cards. Sometimes it's tough love. You know, I find my wife buys things that aren't practical. I don't know, I don't know guys, whether your wife's like this, but on our bed there's about 10 pillars. And I come into our bedroom sometimes and say, Honey, why, why do we have to have all these pillars? Because it takes me, you know, pulling all the pillars up. And finally, I just need one pillow to go to bed with. Is there anybody else out there with me? <laughs> but then she says to me, well, why do, why do you need all that extra chrome on your motorbike? You know, so in all of this submission, you, you don't want to be a doormat. You don't want to lay down and let him walk all over you. You need to be yourself and be who you, who you are in all of this. And, and when it speaks about authority and accountability, all of us are of equal value. But there are different responsibilities. And, and uh, this is the Bible. And right from the beginning, you know, certainly after the fall, God said that Adam would be the head of the home. And... Uh, that's how it does work best. There's a whole lot we could say about that today, but simply here uh, the Bible says in accountability uh, that we need to have that in our marriages. Secondly, it speaks about children. And in verses, uh, what have we got? Chapter 6 there of Ephesians, verse 1, it says, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is right thing to do, honour your father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise. If you honour your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will live a long life on the earth. What a wonderful promise. It's uh, one of the, I think it's the only command with promise because kids need that. You know, and I know we haven't got children in here this morning. But, you know, when, when kids honour their mother and father, they learn a lot about accountability. They learn a lot about honour. And if it's one thing that we are losing in our society today, it's honour and respect. And, and because it's, it's not always taught or modelled in the home. And can I say to every parent and every upcoming parent, you need to be their parent. You can be their mate. But don't try and be their mate and not their parent. Hello. They need, they need a parent. They need to say, no, you're not doing that. Like our father used to say to us, you boys be home before midnight because nothing good happens after midnight. And I'm locking the door. So we used to climb in the windows. <laughs> so, but we needed a parent. We needed to be accountable. And so with, with, with children... They need to learn that because if they'll learn that, you'll keep them out of jail. If they'll respect you, they'll respect the policeman. But if they, if they don't learn respect with their parents, well, then it's, it's going to flow right through their schooling. When they get to work, you know, they'll, they'll learn to respect others in the workplace. And so it all works in that way. And so it says, children, obey your parents. You know, we when we get out of that child stage, whenever that is, for some of us, it's a bit earlier than others. <laughs> yeah, some are still going. But, uh, you know, certainly when, by the time you're 18, 19, you, I think the day you get your licence and you get your car, there's tremendous freedom in that. You drive out the gate, goodbye, Mum. I don't need your taxi anymore. Thank you very much. But you got wheels, you got freedom. And it's then really that all that changes and, and uh, you become accountable for your own actions. But up to that point, 
really your parents are overseeing you and, and they are really accountable for you as a child. And that's so important that we keep those values in our society. I, I think it's terrible that there's 12 and 13 year old kids out at 11 o'clock at night doing a whole lot of stuff and, and I think it's only right that, that uh, police and other people say, well, where, where are their parents? Parents, you need to know where your kids are. And, and uh, young people today, I say, if you'll do that and, and that, and that won't always be easy, but if you'll do that, the Bible says things will go well with you. Everybody say they'll go well. You'll have the best life. And you'll have the longest life. And it says you'll, you'll live. You'll live to a ripe old age. And, and uh, you'll live for, for many, many years. And so you won't be doing stupid things that take away your life early. Then he goes on to speak about the workplace in chapter 6, 5 to 9, moving right along. Uh, in their day, that was masters and slaves, but the principles are much the same today. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. You know, they're, they're powerful words, aren't they? Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Come on. Is that in the Bible? Yes. Some of you are looking at me like a cow at a new gate. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good work we do whether we are slaves or free masters treat your slaves in the same way don't threaten them remember you both have the same master in heaven and he has no favorites and so you know when you turn up for work tomorrow you need to see jesus behind your boss and and in your mind you need to be able to say hey i'm just not serving you Mr. Boss, Mrs. Boss, I'm serving God. This is my workplace and I'm here to serve God in it. And you know, that can be so helpful because you might have one of those bosses you don't really like very much. <laughs> well, if that's the case, just look at it and say, no, I'm actually serving God in this place and I'm going to serve you like I would serve Jesus Christ. Is that, I think this is absolutely powerful. This will change your workplace if you've got a negative attitude and, and it's a difficult place. And so we can serve in, in the light of that, knowing that we're serving God and there's wonderful benefits and rewards. It even says there's rewards for those that will do that. Do it with enthusiasm. Don't only work hard when the boss is looking. You know, when us boys were on the farm with Dad, we'd be working hard, really hard, and then we'd just sit down for a little break. Guess when he would always turn up? But we just sat down, Dad. Well, you haven't done much. Yeah, but that hole was hard to dig. That's post hole there, you know. And so, but in your heart, you've got to have it right in your heart and in your head and make it work in the workplace. And then it says to em employers, if you're an employer here, recognize that the same God that's over your employees is over you and you better do the right thing by them. That's what he's saying there. Then I'd like to move on to uh, government. In Romans 13.13, 13, it says, Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. And so the Bible is very clear about us keeping uh, you know, accountable and submissive to the government that is there. Well, what if that government is ungodly, and what if that government wants to do uh, ask you to do things that are against the Bible. Well, that's where you would have to draw the line. You know, if, if, if the government was wanting you to do something that was against a Christian value, then you would have to say, sorry, I can't do that. Well, we're going to throw you in jail. Yes, well, that's them the breaks. So the Apostle Paul had that in his day. He was preaching the gospel 
And they said, if you preach the gospel anymore, we're going to throw you in jail. He said, well, I'm going to keep preaching the gospel because that's what I'm called to do. And so thank God that the laws in our country at this point allow us to do that. But I was just speaking with a guy last Sunday who was thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. You know, uh, but you know, he was doing it on the streets and I'm not going there too much today. But anyway, the point is we are accountable to governments. We are accountable uh, to be law-abiding citizens. So when you're out on the road tomorrow and it says 100 kilometres, who's been booked this year? Don't put your hand up. <laughs> you know, sometimes if, even if we don't agree with things, and, and uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot of stuff that we mightn't agree with. It still makes a great society if we're in harmony together and, and we're working, you know, together within reason and, and certainly within the boundaries of the Word of God. And so you're not always going to agree with the speed limit. Oh, why is it, you know, only 50 going down here? We should be able to do 60. Well, they're the laws. So don't fight it. Just say, well, they're, they're, they're the laws. That's how it is. You know, oh, I shouldn't have to pay for all these tollways that are going in. Well... it's attitude isn't it it's attitude and and i think if there's an attitude there that says hey this is where we live you know if you don't like it leave Ooh, the place is going quiet <laughs> if you don't like the country leave go get your own island be the king of your own island <laughs> but this is the one we have we voted them into positions of, of, of power and that, them the brakes. Everybody say, they're the brakes. I told you, it wasn't like petrol in your tank. It's oil in the motor. It will stop you breaking down on the road. The last one uh, this morning is, is in regards to the church. In Galatians 6, 1-2... It speaks about being subject or connected, accountable one to another. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, if, any, if another believer is overcome by some sin, now I know that wouldn't happen to any one of us, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back into the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So here it speaks about accountability one to another, that we are accountable one for another and, and we need to protect each other. I think it's wonderful to have a church family that you're committed to that we can watch over one another's life. Hey Bill, I've seen your car down the pub a lot lately mate. How's it going? Do you know what I mean? If you see something about your brother or sister that I think, man, I tell you, the way he looks at his secretary worries me. You need to say, hey, Fred, are you okay? And so there's, a, there's an account in, in a gentle way. Do you know we do it in the workplace? With health and safety, we say, H hang on. You know, there's, there's 240 power hanging on that, that wire. Don't touch it. Don't go near that edge. We do it in the workplace, spiritually. We, we need to be doing it one with another. But Aussies have a culture. Aussies have a culture. I'm my own man and you won't tell me what to do. You know where the biggest... DIY nation, I think, in the world. Do it yourself. Do it yourself. I'll do my own thing. And so, yeah, there's a mateship, but I just believe in the church of Jesus Christ. There needs to be an accountability too. There needs to be a protection one with the other. And if we see each other wandering in the wrong direction or doing the wrong thing, it's not wrong to go to that brother or sister and say, hey, look, How's it going? In a gentle way. Not, not in an arrogant, domineering way, pointing the finger, but in a gentle way, the scripture says, and be aware, hey mate, that you yourself could fall if you're not careful. 
When it comes to leadership, Hebrews 13, 17 is a verse that speaks about pastors and leaders. It says, obey your spiritual... Why don't we all read this together? So here it speaks about leadership in the church, speaks more about pastors here than anything, and it says actually obey spiritual leaders. Now that is in the context of, of life in general, and some tragically, some pastors have, have abused this and uh, you know done the wrong thing. But it's talking about an accountability that, that in, a, in, in church life, in the church family, there, is, there ought to be a good connection between the shepherd and the sheep. And uh, when, when your shepherd says something to you, you know, you need to really take that on board. Well, who do you think you are? You're not the Pope. No, we're not the Pope, but we do love you. And, and hopefully that comes through. And, uh, you know, pastors are never going to get it right 100% of the time. We're not God. But we're out there doing our best and we want God's best for your life. And I think if you can see it in that spirit, but there needs to be an accountability. No, well, I'm not going to be accountable to anyone, Pastor. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, can I tell you that's dangerous ground? This is what we're speaking about. Be subject to one another in the fear of the Lord. Be subject to one another. And so when we come to a heart of accountability, yeah, I want to entrust my, my life and uh, my walk to others in this journey. You know, whenever, when I was a kid and, and, and uh, I had three brothers, whenever dad, here's my father here, whenever dad was around, we always felt safe. When dad wasn't there, anything could have happened, and it normally did. <laughs> but whenever dad was in the room, we, there was a sense of safety in the room. And you know what? I believe that that should be in the church of Jesus Christ. That church is more than just good preaching, great music and whatever. Church is actually a family connected, doing life together. We're watching over one another. We're helping one another. Not in some sort of form that sort of, yeah, well, you know, I'm the boss around here and I'm going to tell you what to do. No, we're, we're going to love Jesus together. We're going to help one another together. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now, this is a, a, the first time this has happened, isn't it? Yes. This is the first, because I've told the musos to get up. When I, when I preach for 30 minutes, the music starts. <laughs> and that's my wind-up cue. <laughs> and that's how it'll be for all the visiting preachers. And you'll be happy about that when somebody is just going on and on and on and on. <laughs> and the longer I go, the louder the music gets. <laughs> No, I haven't told them that, but that's how it'll be for guest preachers. <laughs> let me just, uh, in closing, let, let me just give you seven reasons, and I'm just going to fly through these, seven reasons why accountability is not popular in the church. Seven reasons. Let's, let's have a look at them. Firstly, people hate conflict. Just... I don't want to talk to you about an issue because that can create conflict for me. And so that's why we're always not accountable one to another or we don't take responsibility for one another. Secondly, it's not understood personal growth is a community project. I thank God for the people that have come to me and said, Rod, you know, what you are doing is not good. You can do it this way. And that's helped me in my world. And so all of us, really can help one another. People like their privacy, and we do. And everybody said, I don't like being told what to do. Fourthly, only by my wife, of course, she tells me what to do. Christians are not taught about biblical accountability. Well, you have been today. Christians falsely believe accountability is only to bring shame. So some people think, well, it, it's, they're just putting it on me. Well, that's... That shouldn't be the way it is. That's condemnation. We believe in conviction. 
which always brings hope. Sixthly, some Christians have experienced unhelpful accountability, and that is so true, and that's tragic, where people have had abuse of authority and have not done it rightly. Lastly, Christians lack quality friendships because if, you, if you're not a mate, you know, it's hard to speak into a life that you don't know. And uh, I think it's, it's so important that we build good and strong relationships one with another so we can genuinely come to, an, to one another and know one another and be able to speak into one another's life. Amen. Come to Cafe Church tonight and let's build some relationship. There, there are opportunities that help build relationship one with the other. I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope this is, it will keep the oil in your engine. This, this will help. And so, you know, watch out for others. And, and this week, you know, when you go to work, just see it maybe differently than you have before. I'm serving Jesus in this place. I'm serving God here. And uh, sometimes when it's unfair, well, hey, let's work through that. But I'm going to love my job. I'm going to love, love God. I'm going to love my country. Love my kids, love my marriage. 